live now. We are going live. I make a short introduction and short opening, and then we present on. Okay, we are okay fine. So we are live. Feel Hello look. and welcome everybody. We want the camera. Is... I cannot see the camera. Yes. I don't know. Uh, yeah, no. Hello and welcome uh, to our last day for the from the Space Renaissance Art and Science Festival. Um, I'm really happy that you are here. We had a beautiful two days uh, with interesting lectures about um, uh, space travel, about analog astronauts, about history. Uh, space history uh, about uh, future and space travel and uh, today the day um, is dedicated to art uh, because I think that art uh, belongs to humanity and uh, to all of us and okay <laughs> And uh, our first speaker, as we have some surprises today, uh, but uh, first of all, I would like to give the floor to uh, our member, Steve Salmon, uh, and he's also a member from the British Interplanetary Society. And she will talk about um, space artifacts uh, from imagination to reality. So Steve, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Right, my name is Steve Salmon, and I'm a fellow of the British Interplanetary Society and an artist member of the International Association of Astronomical Artists. Do you have the slideshow going? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. OK. We can hear you perfectly. Okay, and is the slideshow going? Yes, just a moment. So we recover it. Uh, okay, so. Okay, space artifacts. I will share it. And here you go, Steve. Great, thank you. Thanks very much. Okay, as I said, uh, my name is Steve Salmon and I'm a fellow of the British Interplanetary Society and an artist member of the International Association of Astronomical Artists. I'm very happy to be giving you this brief talk today. Next, please. Just as a brief background, in 1991, I decided to take a year out from my job in computing and never returned. I started doing art classes with Wandsworth Adult College in London, England, and went on to do a two-year ceramic diploma course there. After a few years of studio practice, I went on to do a bachelor's degree in fine art ceramics at Camberwell College of Art, now called the University of the Arts. I'm aware that I have a short time, so I'll rattle through these slides as quickly as possible. Next, please. Now, as you can see from the title of this series, with these pieces, I wanted to create an idea of undiscovered or undiscovered ancient artifacts with a sense of mystery as to which civilization had created them, possibly even extraterrestrial, and whether they had ceremonial or even technological purposes. Next, please. Thank you. And these are more of the same. Next, please.
Now these reflect, um, if you like, a secondary interest I had at the time for medieval arms and armor. Of course, there's a little bit of fantasy thrown in there as well. Next, please. Can you see it? Yes, I think I can, yes. I then want to create some more um, pieces which were space related, of which these are a few. Next, please. And I love the fact that within the creative process from a simple idea, next, a new series of works are born. There have been times when it has actually been frustrating for me when the creative spirit grabs me, so to speak. My neurons are firing off all over the place and masses of different designs are flooding into my brain so fast I can't get them all down on paper quickly enough before they disappear from my mind. I imagine there are some artists attending this festival who have had the same experience. Next, please. Uh, these are fairly self-explanatory, I think. Next, please. I also like candles, so I enjoyed making candle holders, as you can see. And I discovered some wonderful ceramic glazes with lo which looked like star fields and arguably moon grey. Next, please. Some more here. Next, please. And these with a possibly extraterrestrial feel, of course. Next, please. One of the things I love most about art is its ability to convey different ideas to an audience. I made this piece as part of a not more colorful Crater Bowl series, but it did have a message behind it that even when we are parted from those we love because of great distances between us or even death, there is so much more that binds us together than separates us through thought, love, memories, and even prayers. Next, please. I took the idea for this piece from the film Mission to Mars made in 2000, where a character called Maggie an astronaut who had died through illness, had always had the dream to stand upon a new world and look beyond it to the next. Next, please. Ah, oh, yes. Uh, no prizes for guessing the source of inspiration for these two. Next, please. So I decided to take a little break from making ceramics it was something of a learning curve and great fun to be working with new materials such as papier mache, polystyrene, plastic card, watercolor paper, etc. And as you can see, I did have a lot of fun with it. Next, please. And then I was thrilled that Apollo 15 command module pilot and honorary fellow of the British Interplanetary Society, Al Warden, agreed to sign one of my pieces to be auctioned at the Reinventing Space Conference in helping to raise funds for the BIS. Next, please. Right. I think in art, it's important to feel free enough to play with ideas and enjoy doing it. I'm something of a collector of old space toys and models from the 1960s onwards, and I found I had a few spare items I wanted to have some fun with. My apologies, by the way, for the less than studio quality of this picture. Next, please. I've often thought of potentially humorous, if sometimes frustrating scenarios in space travel, such as this. Next, please. And again, next, please. So you can see from these that um, there are different scenarios and I just used little models to uh, be able to put the, together the ideas. So this might not be called serious art, if you like. 
And next, please, finally. Right. Um, I imagine that most of you are familiar with these characters called the Daleks, some of the greatest creations of the Doctor Who series of TV series and films. Right, enough of this frivolity. Next, please. Right, this is a wonderful book, which some of you or many of you may be familiar with. And it was gifted to me a couple of years ago by my good friend Fabrizio Bernardini. It has many inspirational images taken with the high rise instrument aboard the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. Next, please. The high rise instrument shows details of the height and depth of the terrain being observed, but in different colors. This is just a small selection of the spectacular images from this book. I think you can easily see why I would want to use these as subjects for my own artwork. Next, please. I extensively sculpted polystyrene for this piece, mounted it on canvas, and then applied common sand and acrylics using dry brushing and shading techniques to bring out the detail. Next, please. Again, the same with uh, this piece. Thank you, next, please. And similarly with these pieces. Next, please. Right, I was delighted when my friend bought four of my works and presented three of them to his colleagues at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena. Indeed, it was a very, very proud moment for me. Next, please. In January this year, <clears throat> sorry, some dear friends of mine within BIS Italia, the, the Italian branch of the British Interplanetary Society, gifted me some days for an exhibition at a lovely gallery in Trastevere here in Rome. And Fabrizio very kindly expended much of his valuable time and effort producing information panels which hung below each of the 16 pieces on show and showing the origins of the images on Mars and with the background text in both English and Italian. Next, please. I've also enjoyed working with watercolors on pieces of cut out watercolor paper and then fixing them to a base coated painted canvas. I like using a selection of different shaped canvases instead of just square or oblong, such as circular, which you can see here, oval, hexagonal, etc. Next, please. Right, I should now like to speak a little bit about the British Interplanetary Society, or BIS, and the wonderful original artworks there, principally by Ralph A. Smith. For those of you who don't already know us, the BIS is the oldest surviving space and astronautics advocacy society in the world. It was founded in 1933 in Liverpool and then moved to London. I'm not going to give you a long history of the society, so don't worry, but we are an international organization with an approximately 2000 members and fellows. Next, please. These three gentlemen are principal, very principal to the BIS and its foundation. Arthur C. Clarke, whom I'm sure you're all familiar with, uh, was one of its earliest members. Harry Ross was an engineer, and we'll be talking more about his work later. And Ralph A. Smith was not only an engineer, but also a great artist, as you will see. Next, please. Now, all of the following works are, in fact, uh, R.A. Smith's work, so I just want you to bear that in mind. I should mention here that, as you know, Arthur C. Clarke visualized the concept of the communication satellite or Earth orbital facilities providing worldwide communication. However, at that time, we didn't have microtransistors, chips, etc. So it was thought that these communications facilities would have to be manned space stations. Next, please. And some more of um, R.A. Smith's work here. Um, the one on the left is Mega Rock, uh, which was a concept uh, he produced, as you can see, uh, back in the 50s. 
Next, please. Uh, the BIS also, uh, through uh, Ross and R.A. Smith, uh, designed the world's first serious concept design of a moonship. Next, please. Again, some wonderful artworks from Smith um, depicting how this would be. Next, please. And again. Right, these, um, <clears throat> this moon suit was uh, developed by Harry Ross and was in fact, uh, believe it or not, the world's first serious design for a moon suit. Next, please. And then um, in 2020, um, Stephen Wisdom decided, <clears throat> or even the year before, decided to uh, actually create this uh, moon suit uh, to the design of Ross. And um, as he himself said, it actually turned out to be <laughs> almost completely impractical. Um, but anyway, uh, you can see it at the National Space Center in Leicester in the UK. Next, please. Some more wonderful artwork. And again, next, please. So obviously they were already thinking of uh, how to properly build a moon base at that time. Next, please. Many of these wonderful original artworks are readily on display in the lobby area, corridors, and the council room of our BIS London headquarters. Next, please. Right, obviously, um, artwork has moved on from strictly 2D, um, and there are quite a few uh, 3D artists out there, of which uh, Adrian Mann is just one. But you can see some of his work, great work on YouTube, um, primarily through Reaction Engine's limited website, depicting uh, Skylon, which is what you can see on the right-hand side. And then he also did a wonderful model uh, on the left here of our BIS project Daedalus uh, Starship. And the original paper for this was uh, issued in the Journal of the British Interplanetary Society uh, back in the 1970s. I'm very proud to have an original copy of that, I have to say. Next, please. Right, in uh, 2015, uh, the BIS and the IAAA, International Association of Astronomical Artists, held a very successful joint art exhibition called Visions of Space, held in Somerset, England. Next, please. And then two years later, thankfully, they created a whole new joint exhibition. Next, please. I would, of course, like to show you more of the very impressive artworks which were at both exhibitions, but space and time is against me, are against me. Matt Irvin here on the right, some of you may know, is a technical consultant and visual effects designer who has worked primarily for the BBC in the UK on TV series such as Doctor Who, The Sky at Night, Tomorrow's World, Blake Seven, etc. It is my sincere wish that the IAAA and the BIS hold more joint space art exhibitions in the future, and perhaps more specifically, to have artworks and models which can be handled and touched, so as to include visitors who may be partially or totally blind. As many things, sorry, as you can appreciate, there are a vast number of people who cannot readily access, if you like, many things which most of us take for granted because they have limited or no vision and who are possibly also deaf. So we at the BIS are working to try to resolve this issue by using various technologies and initiatives to make our events more available to everyone. Next, please. I'd just like to mention briefly a little more about the BIS. 
BIS Italia have taken part in ESA's Open Days for Schools events uh, for a number of years now at Ezrin here in Rome. These events are for five days in one week, usually in March, with three to 500 students and teachers visiting every day. It's a huge privilege and a great pleasure to take part in these STEM education events, as well as the European Researchers' Nights. And now officially I can say <laughs> I have worked for ESA. Next, please. Right, so please do visit the BIS and IAAA websites and see all the many, many fascinating lectures and conferences and events that they do. Next, please. And thank you very much for your attention and especially thank you to Adriano, Bernard, Sabine and all the team for having organized this wonderful festival. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs> I'm so happy that um, we invited you or that finally we, we could get together and um, that you presented here. Your artwork is amazing. I really like this. And, Thank you. Um, I think we, we, we should uh, talk more about this. Uh, you will see now, keep with us. Um, yeah. Well, now is he our yeah. president? Yeah, so, okay, uh, as a president of Space Renaissance International, but as also as a long-term colleague of ESA, as I've seen that we are now <laughs> working both for ESA, that's amazing to see that, <laughs> that we can see that we can join our effort and uh, to have a future uh, endeavor uh, for art uh, and space, even going to space. You know, and now, now we proudly present uh, Peter Gotthard because he has composed for our society a hymn. Peter, the stage is yours. Mm -hmm. So you can get uh, here, you can read it, and yes. um, you, yeah, you know, you can sing. Soulful. Also, the text at the moment oh. is La 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 uh, in English. We do the <laughs> And you, the stage the, is yours? Yeah, yeah, I do the bass. Yeah. I do the bass. Okay. <laughs> um, Peter Gotthard is a composer for film music. And yeah, I show him the camera. Uh, for film music, and he composed music for The Legend of Paul and Paula, a very, very famous uh, movie uh, at the air time. And the uh, band was uh, singing and playing the song, the, the title songs became famous and they started a long, long career and uh, just a few years ago they, they finished their career. So they are more than 70 years old in the meanwhile and uh, they are still uh, on stage playing music uh, and they started their career, they were discovered uh, because he composed music for them. So, Peter, the stage is yours. Yes, thank you. I speak in my own language, Deutsch. Okay. Ja, okay. Ich fasse mich kurz in Anbetracht der Verzögerung. Ich wollte einen etwas längeren Vortrag machen, wie man einen Hymnen schreibt. Sabine hat mir gesagt, schreib doch mal schnell Hymnen. Yeah, Sabine told me, oh, just wrote me a hymn. And what's going on in the head? Man just got a model. And then you had your head some model. Actually, I want to. Can you hear me? Yeah. We are the world, we are the world. We are singing, give me the chance. Von dem Beatles, ja? So, was geht an natürlich zuerst mal durch den Kopf? Also, das hier hat vorerst in your mind, when you start, if someone tells you, 
also composed the um, text somehow. Uh, text is the uh, don't have text, they thought it's la la la. This is the ganz interesting Frage for the composition. It's a very interesting question for a composer. Er muss also erst einmal ein Musik zuerst haben. The first step. The first step of the yeah. music. So. Und da habe ich geguckt. And then he was looking. Es gibt. There is. Ich lasse das weg. Musik Holländer. Ja. We have prepared a long uh, presentation, but uh, as we were late now, yes, shortness. Uh, we know it's an international no. Ich bin von Kopf bis Fuß auf Ah, genau. Das uh, international song. Uh, ich bin von Kopf bis Fuß aus aus Berlin eingestellt. Und so weiter und so weiter. Und das ist interessant, das ist wahrscheinlich äh, nicht üblich in dieser in diesen Professionen, dass der Komponist den Text selber macht. Ja, und das interessante Ding ist, normalerweise ist es nicht üblich, dass der Komponist den Text selber macht. Wir sprachen in der DDR von Schimmel. Man sagt eigentlich, äh, ja, ein provisorischer Text, der für den Text ah, ja. Autor ja, ja. ein Modell ist. Es ja. hat, wir haben einen provisorischen Text, äh, zu füllen. So that's the sound. So, uh, we have it also when we write and we have some strange letters, uh, ypsum, blah, 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 something else. Yes, yeah, it's had ever to run 30. Okay. For the solid time, we have 19, uh, 30. For the film, the blue angel. For the blue the blue angel. Was the money in the English? Yeah. Stage, the music. For the producer, and uh, he presented to the producer the music. Can you hear me? So that uh, that is yeah. 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 And he put the text. I've been from top to suit off. Liebe eingestellt. And uh, the producer said, "It's genius. We take it." So, but he he only put it. Uh, yeah, to, to have some text to fill the melody. Oh, joking! That's a new world. Interessant. Interesting. Mr. Michel Legrand. Ich habe ihn in meinem letzten Paris-Besuch in, 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 in Olympia erlebt. Ah, and his last visit to Paris, he saw him in Olympia. Und er hat hauptsächlich, in diesem Falle nicht, aber war sehr befreundet und wahrscheinlich noch enger mit der Familie Bergman ah, in der USA. Fast alle Texte sind von Bergman. Mit der Familie Bergman, die war aber er hat eine große Freundschaft und fast alle Texte sind von ihm. Texte sind von ihm, aber es ist von ihm. Bei diesem Titel I will wait for you. Mm -hmm. uh, Frage ich mich immer, wo hat er das her? Uh, is wondering from what he got it. Or from where he got it. Yeah, what does he tell him? Oh, you're not going to be a good person.
Ja, ich bin sicher, dass die Musik zuerst da war. Es gibt sehr viele Titel, die allerdings von Bergman, was ich schon sagte, von Bergman getextet wurden. In Paris bin ich auf die einzige Straße gegangen, wo man Noten kaufen kann. Und ich bin lange die Straße rauf und runter gegangen, um diese Noten zu kaufen. I want to buy Michel de Long. Und der Verkäufer? Zu hoch. Okay. Alles nur in Texten. Yeah. Er hat wahrscheinlich seine Seele an Warner Brothers verkauft. In vor 50 Jahren hat ein Komponist ein, für einen Film mehrere Titel komponiert. Ich spiele nur mal die Melodie. And you will play the melody.
Paris, meine Geige. Ich bin der Falsche. Okay? Ja, ich bin Go home, bring it here. Okay, Und jetzt spiele ich das Ganze mal. Es gibt also ein Vorspiel. I said maybe the new language for speaking on the moon will be called Lunish or Mondish. Yes. Ich dachte, er hat schon einen Text fertig. Ah, ich sagte, er hat schon einen Text fertig. Ja. Uh, Peter, I thank you and we will not finish this. this. Um, can you share my screen, uh, Andrea? Ja, ich war. Ein Applaus. Genau. Ja. And? the camera in, in this direction. Uh, oh, yeah, I'll leave it here. Uh, could you share the screen, please? What do you want to share? 
the screen you and my presentation for, yeah. Mar for Mars. Yeah. So now. Now I will do the intro uh, I wanted to do in the morning <laughs> and <laughs> okay. Yeah. Have a slide, please. Oh. <clears throat> And okay, so as I told, uh, we had a very, very beautiful festival so far. The first two days were very interesting, and I'm very grateful. Good chance. Good chance. And um, we had a very great festival, very great days, um, and uh, I'm very grateful that the Asenhold of the Planet Heim Berlin Foundation has provided uh, us this beautiful place, the Asenhold Observatory. Um, later in this day, we'll learn a, bit, a little bit more about uh, this um, observatory and also Dr. Lumin gave a talk about the history uh, two days ago. And next slide, please. Uh, we also would like to thank uh, very much uh, our sponsors, first of all, Planet Time Berlin Foundation. Um, also the Space Renaissance International, Space Renaissance Germany, the Support Association of the Aschenhold Observatory and the Science Grant Planetarium. Um, they donated us a beautiful barbecue yesterday. It was really nice. And beautiful Mars uh, and Ulvik uh, sponsored us uh, the get together from the first day. And um, the lawyers, Recht, uh, Rechtsanwalt Steinhäuser and Sichang, uh, has donated some uh, travel costs for one of our keynote speakers. And um, the committee uh, from the uh, ITACUS committee from the International Aeronautical Federation uh, is supporting our um, festival and uh, the following project we want to launch now. Could you share, uh, make the next slide, please? Uh, if we think we want to go to space, we want to go to the moon, but also to the Mars, and we think this should be together and not only one person or one nation, we should do it together, we should be united. The next slide, please. And our project is now Art Goes to Mars. So next slide, please, and start the movie. Start the movie. Yeah. Hello, welcome to the rooftop of the Asimov Observatory in Berlin. You can see in the background the longest tail selected from on Earth, the 21 meter. The Ashland Observatory was founded in the year 1996 and uh, by the founder Friedrich Simon Ashland. And here, this place, our space renaissance art and science takes place. And I'm so excited to announce our new project. Together, as a mass society, uh, space renaissance international, and the Manhattan Berlin Foundation. We want to launch our new project, Art Goes to Mars. Why Art Goes to Mars or to space? Art belongs to humanity. That's why uh, Art has to go with us to come to space. Why uh, is Art an important part of 
our effort to explore Mars. And uh, the reason is, is because artists can see with their minds what other people have yet to see with their minds. And so they can uh, bring Mars to us to, and, and, and not only the Mars today, the, the Mars that could be photographed if we sent cameras to the right place, but uh, could see what is going to be there. Um, the, to basically make the, the vision sensuous uh, to convey uh, to people of what is actually there in a way better than a camera can, but more importantly to portray what could be there, which no camera can. What does it take to bring our civilization beyond the cradle of the earth? It will take some scientists, some engineers, some astronauts, some architects, and all the disciplines, and not only physical objects for all humanity. But of course, as humanity, we have to bring as well all areas of art. And for this reason, Space Renaissance International, together with the Mars Society, are launching an initiative to bring art to Mars. And this year, we are organizing a number of events, the Space Renaissance Festival in Berlin, but as well the uh, event at the International Astrophysical Congress in Paris in September, where we will all gather and we will have also various uh, proposals of art that we can send to Mars. So join us and uh, let's all, all go beyond our cuddle to the Earth, to the Moon, and to Mars. Thank you. We would like to ask you to send us your work of art. This can be fine art pictures, collage artworks, photographs, stories, science fiction, music composition, dances, theater presentations, or movies. Since transportation is very expensive, we would like to collect the words on a USB stick and send it to Mars. At the same time, we will organize uh, exhibitions and performances. We will select 100 artworks to start the journey to Mars. These works of artworks will later be collected in a book. Maybe we can raise enough money to fund the shipping of this book as well. Then, with this book, in addition to our artwork, we would lay the first cornerstone for a library <laughs> on Mars. <laughs> and now, maybe your artwork will be included. Are you in? Can you put the next slide? Yeah, well, oh, oh. <laughs> there you go to Mars. Uh, next slide. Yeah. So, artists, now it's your turn. Are you in? Um, send us your artwork. And I think uh, if we have uh, the first cornerstone, maybe for a library on Mars, uh, it would be better. It depends how much money we can fund. Um, but uh, I think it is a nice project and uh, we are happy that we can launch it today. Today is a great day that we uh, launch our Art Guard Goes to Mars project. Hurra, right. so let's go with our uh, Captain uh, Mars Art uh, Curator, uh, Sabina. And so we expect uh, in all the areas that you have uh, mentioned, because art uh, is, uh, has multi, many dimensions. And uh, so we want to bring uh, with the humanities, even more than humanity. Uh, some, uh, we want to witness uh, what Earth has to offer when we are going to expand into space. And Mars is a very important destination. You know, Mars is the size of all land of Earth that are emerged. So it's uh, really a world where uh, all humanities have the, uh, a role to play and art among that. So that art goes to Mars. Yeah, thank you. 
Now I'll turn to the next presentation, why I can space. Um, uh, what time is it now? Yes, uh, 10, to, 10 to 11. 10 to 11. Actually, we have now. Marie Louise Reuter, it hasn't come. We have. Um, we have in space. Yeah. Nee, uh, Michael, because we are running out of time and, um, yeah, and yeah, but um, Peter has taken the time from me. So uh, Peter got hurt. So then uh, we we ask now Professor Michael Klichter to come to stage. Um, can you share his um, presentation? Mm -hmm. I skip my, my, I, my yeah project. yeah. Um, I'm really happy that he has come to Berlin. We, he was also already guest in our webinar series. And um, you can be curious what he has, has to tell us and how to build a planner. Michael, I'm happy that you are here. I'm also very happy. Is it in German or in English? So you can choose. Um, yeah. I could do whatever you want. Um, you can do it. Uh, the note is announced in, in German and later in English. Okay, also mache ich um, zunächst auf Deutsch und Englisch. Okay. Super. Ja, vielen herzlichen Dank, liebe Sabine, für die äh, Einladung hier nach Berlin. Vielen Dank an die Organisatoren, dass ich heute hier sein darf und Ihnen meine, ich würde sagen, Handwerkskunst vorstellen darf. Äh, ich bin traditioneller Globusbauer. Ähm, Jetzt kann man sich natürlich fragen, das ist doch ein großer Anachronismus. Heutzutage hat kaum noch jemand einen Globus zu Hause. Und ich baue auch keinen Globus der Erde, sondern ich baue Globen von, äh, von, vom Mars und vom Mond. Aber wenn Sie hier in dieses schöne Gebäude hineinkommen, dann werden Sie wunderbare Beispiele sehen von Globen in diesen Vitrinen. Und dort sehen Sie tolle Mondgloben. Marsgloben und auch einen Himmelsglobus. Und dahinter steckt doch der sehr menschliche Gedanke, dass wir unsere Welt und unser Universum und das Wissen darüber in eine Form bringen wollen. Wir wollen es abbilden. Wir wollen es in die Hand nehmen. Wir wollen es anschauen und darüber staunen. Und deswegen zeige ich Ihnen heute, wie baut man eigentlich einen solchen Planeten? Und ich zeige Ihnen Mars und Mond. Next slide, please. Das sind die beiden Objekte, die ich herstelle. Und Sie werden feststellen, beide Objekte haben einen kleinen Kniff. Ähm, der Marsglobus zeigt nicht etwa die Karte, wie wir sie heute von der NASA kennen, hochaufgelöste äh, Fotos, sondern er zeigt eine Marskarte, die schon über 100 Jahre alt ist. Und sie basiert auf den fantastischen Ideen von Percival Lowell. Sie zeigt die Karte der Marskanäle. Eine auf wunderbare Weise falsche Karte, aber ich finde ein historisches Objekt, welches äh, es wert war, noch einmal neu aufleben äh, zu lassen. Verstehen Sie mich nicht falsch, ich bin kein Marskanal-Prediger, ich glaube nicht an die Marskanäle, nur das so als Disclaimer. Das ist ein traditionell hergestellter Globus, bestehend aus zwölf Papiersegmenten, die aufgebracht werden auf einer Gipskugel. Und ähm, der zweite Globus, den ich baue, das ist äh, eine komplett andere Geschichte. Es ist ein Mondrelief-Globus. Das heißt, ähm, dieser Mondrelief-Globus basiert auf den äh, neuesten NASA-Daten. Das ist der äh, Lunar Orbiter Laser Altimeter Datensatz, den ich in ein 3D-Modell verwandelt habe. Und Sie können jeden Krater, jeden Berg, jede Rille fühlen. Sie können eine Lichtquelle an diesen Globus heranführen, der von der Seite drauf scheint und Sie werden einen wunderbaren Effekt haben, nämlich so, äh, wie es in echt ist. Licht und Schatten werden sich genauso abbilden wie an unserem äh, Nachthimmel. Gut, next slide, please. Wie zum Teufel baut man einen Globus? Ich kann auch. Wie zum Teufel baut man einen solchen Globus? Und wenn Sie ein Globusbauer werden wollen, dann werden Sie mit zwei Problemen konfrontiert sein. Das erste Problem ist die Kugel. Und das zweite Problem ist die Karte. Und beide Probleme hängen miteinander zusammen. Ja. 
Und ähm, ich zeige Ihnen jetzt erst einmal ein historisches Vorbild. Das ist Räts Mondglobus. Der kommt aus dem Jahr 1963. Und ähm, hier vielleicht zwei Dinge. So ein Globus zeigt immer den Wissensstand zu einem gewissen Zeitpunkt. Er ist ein Zeitdokument. Und ähm, dieser Mondglobus, wenn Sie den ein bisschen drehen, sehen Sie plötzlich eine weiße Stelle. Warum ist da eine solche große weiße Stelle? Natürlich, weil wir zu dem Zeitpunkt noch nicht wussten, wie sieht die komplette Mondrückseite aus. Und somit ist es ein Zeitdokument. Und ähm, wie ich schon gesagt habe, ein solcher traditioneller äh, äh, Globus ist hergestellt aus zwölf Papierstreifen. Nächstes Slide, please. So, und wie bringt man jetzt beides zusammen? Die nächste. Zunächst einmal das Kugelproblem. Sie können versuchen, sich eine Kugel im Internet zu bestellen. Sie werden Styroporkugeln finden, doch Sie haben damit ein Riesenproblem. Diese Styroporkugeln sind leider keine Kugeln. Sie weichen sehr stark von einer idealen Kugelform ab und Sie werden niemals diese zwölf Papiersegmente, die für eine perfekte Kugel hergestellt sind, auf eine solche Styroporkugel ohne Fehler aufbringen können. Deswegen habe ich mich entschieden, diese Kugeln selber herzustellen. Ich habe eine, eine Aluminiumform an, anfertigen lassen, aus, Alu, äh, aus Aluminium, CNC gefräst. Sie ist so präzise, dass sie von einer idealen Kugel nur 0,01 mm abweicht. Das heißt, damit können Sie arbeiten. Äh, ich führe in dieser Aluminiumform eine zweite äh, Hemisphäre ein und äh, ich äh, befestige diese mit Schrauben. Es entsteht ein Zwischenraum und diesen Zwischenraum fülle ich mit einer Gipsmasse. Das sehen Sie auf der rechten Seite und lasse diese aushärten. Nächste Folie bitte. Wenn das Ganze ausgefertigt, ausgehärtet ist, dann können Sie diese Hemisphären entnehmen. Dann haben Sie zwei, kleben diese zusammen. Nächste Folie. Die sind aus Gips. Ja. Die, sind aus Gips. die Karte war ein großes Problem. Als Vorbild dient die Karte von Percival Lowell aus seinem astronomischen Buch Mars and Canal. Von 1905 ist diese Karte. Ich habe diese eingescannt. Was ich Ihnen hier zeigen möchte, ist die Tatsache, dass die Qualität der Karte nicht besonders groß oder hoch ist. Das heißt, ich musste diese Karte sehr stark nachbearbeiten. Und das habe ich gemacht. Und am Ende mittels mathematischer Transformation in zwölf Papiersegmente oder in zwölf Segmente unterteilt. Man nennt das auch ein sphärisches Zweieck. Das sehen Sie unten rechts in der Folie. Nächste Folie bitte. Diese wurde koloriert, diese wurde nachbearbeitet. Am Ende haben Sie äh, sphärische Zweiecke. Sie sehen jetzt hier ein Beispiel. Die sind 47 cm lang und 7,85 cm breit. Nächste Slide. Was tun Sie damit? Naja, ein solches sphärisches Zweieck kann man sich mit einer Orange ganz gut vorstellen. Eine Orangenscheibe, die Oberfläche einer Orangenscheibe, ist nichts anderes als ein sphärisches Zweieck. Wenn Sie zwölf davon haben, formiert sich daraus die Kugel. Nächste Folie bitte. Das sind jetzt diese zwölf sphärischen Zweiecke ausgedruckt auf Künstlerpapier 70 Gramm. Ich benutze dafür eine wasserfeste Tintenstrahl-Methode und kann jetzt eigentlich meinen Job starten als Globusbauer. Ich muss die jetzt auf die Kugel aufbringen. Nächste Folie. Und das sie, schaut sich immer so leicht an, aber probieren Sie es mal selber. Ich weiß nicht, Sie haben bestimmt schon mal tapeziert. Tapezieren ist so ein sehr schönes Beispiel dafür. Sie müssen es versuchen, ohne ähm, Risse und ähm, ohne Beulen aufzubringen. Und das ist ein sehr, sehr mühsamer Prozess, den Sie lernen müssen. Ich habe anderthalb Jahre ge gebraucht, um, diese, um dieses Handwerk wirklich ausführen zu können. Und der naive Gedanke, das mache ich mal so am Abend, hat sich als falsch herausgestellt. Das Schöne ist, machen Sie äh, ruhig weiter, die nächste Folie. Sie sehen im Prozess, wie sich der Globus formiert. Mit jedem neuen sphärischen Zweieck sehen Sie, äh, dass Sie Ihrem Ziel näher kommen. Und ähm, hier sehen Sie, wie ich zwischendurch immer wieder die Exaktheit messe. Ich akzeptiere eigentlich kein, keine Abweichung der idealen äh, Aufklebung von mehr als einem Millimeter. Nächste Slide. Und wenn Sie alles äh, gut beklebt haben, dann kommen noch Polarkappen drauf, um dem Ganzen einen, äh, einen ästhetischen, äh, schönen äh, Anblick zu geben. Nächste Folie bitte. Das sieht man äh, hier. Jetzt sieht man hier mal den Südpol. Diese Polarkappen werden traditionell auch zu dekorativen Zwecken verwendet. Ich habe hier den Namen des Globus eingetragen. Äh, diese Polarkappe verdeckt die zwölf Spitzen der äh, 
der sphärischen Zweiecke und schützt diese auch. Nächste Folie bitte. Und dann am Ende haben Sie eben diese Materialisierung dieser Karte von 1905 wieder als dreidimensionales Objekt vor sich stehen. Da drin stecken ungefähr 50 Arbeitsstunden und drei bis vier Monate Arbeit. Gut, kommen wir zum Mond. Ich sagte ja schon, der Mond ist jetzt komplett anders. Der Mondlogos ist ein Reliefglobus. Und er basiert nicht auf einer fantastischen Karte, sondern er basiert auf den besten Daten, die wir von unserem Mond haben, nämlich von den äh, Lola-Daten. Nächste Folie bitte. Und hier zeige ich Ihnen Schokohasen. Warum zeige ich Ihnen Schokohasen? Weil so ein Schokohase ganz ähm, bildhaft darstellt, wie das Objekt hergestellt ist. Sie alle wissen, wie ein Schokohase aussieht. Der ist von innen drin hohl. Wie wird der hergestellt? Der wird hergestellt, im Deutschen sagt man, mit einem Schleudergussverfahren. Das heißt, die Schokolade wird in eine Form eingefüllt. Diese Form rotiert nun und die Schokolade berührt jede einzelne Stelle der Form und härtet dabei aus. Nächste Folie bitte. Und dasselbe Problem hatte ich mit meinem Mondglobus auch. Das heißt, ich musste also diesen Schleuderbus, dieses Schleuderbusverfahren etablieren. Dafür habe ich eine sogenannte Rotocaster-Maschine entwickelt und die auch zusammen mit Timo Weinzeiner gebaut. Zweites Problem, Sie brauchen eben das Muttermodell, basierend auf den NASA-Daten und können dann daraus eine Silikonform herstellen. Nächste Folie bitte. Die NASA-Daten können Sie sich runterladen. Und Sie können, ich habe das damals mit MATLAB gemacht, daraus ein 3D-Modell erstellen. Das sehen Sie jetzt hier. Damit gehen Sie, und das war auch wieder so ein naiver Gedanke, damit gehen Sie zu einem 3D-Drucker, einen Laden, der einen 3D-Drucker hat und sagen Sie dem, der soll das ausdrucken. Und das auch noch furchtbar günstig, wie man mir immer gesagt hat. Nein, 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 das stimmt alles nicht. Erstens, natürlich brauchen Sie eine, also ein, eine Form, die aus einem Stück besteht. Das heißt, Sie brauchen einen Drucker, der eine gewisse Größe hat. Dann brauchen Sie jemanden, der das auch in einer guten Qualität ausdrucken kann. Und das ist nicht der typische 3D-Druck, sondern das ist selektives Laser Sintern. Das Ganze ist dann alles andere als günstig im Übrigen. Eine Folie weiter. Diese Mutterform des Mondes, die sehen Sie jetzt hier auf der linken Seite. Sie ist jetzt schon vorbereitet für den Silikonausguss. Das heißt, ich habe sie auf eine Platte aufgetragen, die ein Loch hat. Sie sehen also jetzt nur die eine Hemisphäre. Und ich habe schon alles vorbereitet für den Silikonabguss. Nächste Folie bitte. Dann gießen Sie die schöne Silikonmasse oben drüber und lassen das Ganze aushärten. Wenn das Ganze fertig ist, drehen Sie das Ganze um und machen es mit der anderen Hemisphäre in derselben Art und Weise. Nächste Folie. Dann haben Sie jetzt also diese Silikonform. Ich habe außenrum noch eine harte Schale gegossen, weil Silikon ist natürlich sehr flexibel. Wenn Sie da Gips einführen, dann entsteht eine Beule. Also brauchen Sie eine sichernde Form. Das ist dieses hell bräunliche Objekt um diese ganze Kuppel herum. So, nächste Folie bitte. Da füllen Sie nun, das ist nochmal das Gleiche, da können wir gleich drüber springen, da füllen Sie nun Ihre Gipsmasse wieder ein und schließen das Ganze. Nächste Folie. Und diese etwas unförmig aussehende Form, die ähm, befestigen Sie jetzt in Ihrer Rotocaster-Maschine. Nächste Folie. Und auch hier können wir eigentlich drüber hinwegspringen, weil der Witz kommt eigentlich erst jetzt. Jetzt ist diese Form eingespannt in diese Maschine. Sie starten die Maschine und diese Maschine dreht sich jetzt über 27 Minuten. Nächste Folie bitte. Und das Ganze dreht sich in X- und in Y-Achse und äh, gewährleistet, dass Ihre Gipsmasse wirklich jeden Millimeter dieser Form berührt und dabei aushärtet. Nächste Folie. So, und dann öffnen Sie das Ganze und dann haben Sie eine perfekte Replikation Ihres Muttermodells. So, und jetzt könnten Sie sagen, ach toll, dass der Prozess so toll geklappt hat. Ich freue mich jedes Mal wie ein kleines Kind, wenn ich das sehe. Nur jetzt beginnt erst die Arbeit, weil ich möchte keinen weißen Mond, sondern ich möchte den Mond so, wie er ist. Das heißt, jetzt startet die Handarbeit, nämlich die Handkolorierung. Nächste Folie. Die Albedo aufzutragen ist ein Prozess, der mich sehr viel Zeit kostet. Und auch, äh, ich bin relativ perfektionistisch. Ich will es wirklich so haben, wie er in Wirklichkeit aussieht. Ich benutze dafür Mondatlanten, aber auch Softwarekarten, um sie möglichst detailgetreu und echt aufzutragen. Ich bin nicht immer ganz hundertprozentig zufrieden, aber ich ähm, bewege mich sozusagen konstant in eine fortschrittliche Richtung. Auch dieser Globus 50 Arbeitsstunden, hauptsächlich wegen der Handkolorierung und drei bis vier Monate Arbeit. So, nächste Folie. Und damit bin ich auch schon am Ende. Die Folie sieht hier ein bisschen schräg aus. Ich danke all den Leuten, die hier drauf zu sehen sind, vor allen Dingen Christoph Höhmann, 
Oliver Bartel, Tino Weinsheimer äh, und all den anderen und Ihnen für Ihre Aufmerksamkeit. Vielen Dank. Vielen, vielen, vielen herzlichen Dank äh, für den schönen Vortrag. Ähm, wir sind jetzt ein bisschen okay. spät dran, es ist um elf. Ähm, um die Zeit jetzt rauszuholen, würde ich sagen, machen wir zehn Minuten Pause, ähm, dass wir dann pünktlich ähm, um elf Uhr zehn anfangen mit Tanja Lehmann. Ähm, we are a little bit late and uh, to get back in time, we have a 10 minutes break now, uh, then Tanja will give her talk, so that uh, we are on time, back on time. So. 10 minutes coffee break.
You, you are Tanya. Tanya. Okay. Uh, I have to check. I do have the PowerPoint on a USB stick, but I would prefer clicking through it myself because it, it is here. Um, this is not a PowerPoint because um, that's a PDF. It's not the right. I would like to use. A PowerPoint. Give me, give me your, give me the PowerPoint then. It's. It's better before yesterday. Yesterday we tried to connect another computer and it was not. Right. not easy. Sorry. No, uh, we are missing Einar. We are missing Sheila. Okay, here's the stick. And Sarah. The so the thing is, I have the videos on the stick too. Yeah. I couldn't send them. Okay. But if I started from the PDF, I have to go into the internet and I don't want to do that. No, no. Uh, so is it Kunst on the... Yeah, screen? this is it, yeah. And you need the, the PowerPoint and the, and the, and two. the, the two movies. Okay. And not the PDF because the PDF you already have. It's these two, these three, yeah. Microsoft always make things more complicated. Before you had the copy option. Now you have to open another thing to have the copy option. Oh. It should be, Microsoft should be terminated. <laughs> By a cosmic event, I don't know. <laughs> okay. Uh, this is that's it, good. yeah. Yeah, because basically I have two videos in there and the other are okay. internet links, but so I guess we can skip the internet links and if uh, someone wants to what is the uh, they are still in the coffee break, but I thought I'll I'll come down to set up the thing before we start. Yeah, Otherwise uh, we it's, have to start now. Uh, should I go tell them? Because she has to introduce you. Yeah, yeah, I know. So this is where we can start. Sabine is in front of the door, and I think she somehow has a doctor. I'm not sure. Now we. Okay. Please call the people. Call the people back. We're going to restart. Okay, so we are recording. Sorry, I cannot say it in German. However, we have our next presentation by Tanya Lehmann. It will talk about art und Sperrelosik or something yeah. like that. Can, can art, you... art and weightlessness. So... Ah, okay, okay. Zero gravity. Yeah. Excellent. So we're waiting our in presence audience to rejoin the room because we have a very short coffee break now. And yeah, some, some people is coming with their cup, coffee cup. 
because we randomly interrupted their coffee break. So, okay. <laughs> Waiting for also for our local organizer, the imperable Sabine Heinz. Yeah, she's coming. Okay. Great. So good. Sabine, it's to you to introduce yes. Tanya. So I now have the pleasure, I have to speak into, into the camera. Yeah. Now I have the pleasure to introduce, we are back after the break, and I have the pleasure to introduce Tanya Lehmann. Uh, she's also from the Verein zur Förderung der Raumfahrt. Uh, it's an association to support uh, space travel. And Tanya, has done several parable flights and uh, she will give us a nice talk. I'm really curious to learn more about this. You speak in German, no? Yeah, okay, then sage ich es nochmal auf Deutsch. Also Tanja hat schon mehrere Parabelflüge durchgeführt und ähm, sie ist vom Verein zur Förderung der Raumfahrt und wird jetzt darüber sprechen. Bin sehr gespannt auf den Vortrag. Ich freue mich wirklich drauf. The stage is yours. Okay. Can you hear me? Okay. I'm Tanja Niemann and I'm... Ah, yeah. Okay, ich wollte ja auf Deutsch reden. Ich komme immer durcheinander, wenn ich Englisch und Deutsch gleichzeitig... Ja, yeah. okay. Also meine Präsentation, da geht es um die Verbindung von Kunst und Schwerelosigkeit. Und da habe ich jetzt ein paar Beispiele. Okay. Also offenbar hat es Menschen schon immer fasziniert, dass man vielleicht irgendwie fliegen kann oder so. Das ist jetzt von der Sixtinischen Kapelle von Michelangelo. Ja, ich habe es ja schon geschrieben. Woher hat er gewusst, wie das ausschaut, wenn man schwebt? Und seit über 40 Jahren oder 50 oder 60 sind es jetzt, glaube ich, sogar schon, fliegt der Mensch in den Weltraum und hat sich mit der Schwerlosigkeit vertraut gemacht und dass da natürlich die Kunst dann auch einen Anteil daran hat. Das ist ähm, nicht verwunderlich, weil die Kunst, wie die Sabine schon gesagt hatte, Menschen schon seit jeher begleitet und deshalb möchte ich hier einen kleinen Überblick geben. Es gab schon... Relativ früh, wo das mit Science Fiction angefangen hat, Literatur, wo dann dieses Konzept auch drin vorgekommen ist. Der Jules Verne in der Reise um den Mond hat sich das als sehr erheiternd ähm, vorgestellt. Seine Protagonisten genießen das. Und das Bild hier ist aus dem damaligen Buch, das, das war so illustriert, da hatten sie, natürlich hat man das heute nicht, dass man irgendwelche ähm, Hühner und Hunde mit in die Raumkapsel nimmt. Aber oft ist es halt irgendwie nur ein nettes Beiwerk. Also bei Perry Roden hat man irgendwie das Gefühl, er, er hat irgendwas mit Schwerelosigkeit, wenn es in die Geschichte passt. Ähm, bei Star Trek kommt es eigentlich ganz, ganz selten vor und so. Und... Ja, in, in ganz viel Science-Fiction-Literatur kommt es halt eher nicht vor, aber es gibt dann doch einiges. Okay, weiter. Zum Beispiel gibt es da diese Stardance-Trilogie von Spider und Jan Robinson. Ähm, da ist die Schwerelosigkeit das Hauptthema. Und sie hat es mit Tanzen verknüpft und die Sehnsucht nach freier Bewegung im Raum. Sie sollte eigentlich auch einen Space Shuttle Flug machen und leider hat Challenger das dann beendet. Also wer sich für ähm, Literatur interessiert, wo tatsächlich Schwerlosigkeit das Thema ist, der sollte diese Trilogie lesen. Das ist ganz interessant. Ich weiß jetzt nur nicht, ob es die auf Deutsch gibt. Ich habe es auf Englisch gelesen. 
Okay. Ja, abbildende Kunst gibt es auch. Aber dass man Kunst in Schwerelosigkeit herstellt, ist doch eher selten. Und das hat der Frank Pietro Nigro gemacht bei der NASA. Er hat sich dafür eine Kabine gebaut und bei einem Parabelflug einfach Farbe in der Kabine verteilt. Er hatte dann da halt so entsprechend Malerklamotten an und so weiter und hat gesagt, ja, das ist jetzt eine neue Art von Gemälde, hat es Drift Painting genannt und naja, am Ende der Parabel fällt natürlich die rumfliegende Farbe runter und offenbar ging es ihm dann auch nicht besonders gut wegen der Dämpfe von der Farbe und so, weil er die ganze Zeit in diesem Ding eingeschlossen war. Also so ungefähr wie auf dem Bild sah es aus. Okay. Und aus Deutschland gibt es auch einen Künstler, Charles Will. Der ist allerdings 2005 schon gestorben. Vielleicht kennen ihn noch manche aus der Werbebranche. Stichwort Afrikola und Volkswagen. Es ist hier auch ein Beispiel aus Raumfahrt konkret. Da war das mal Thema und das war eigentlich der, der Beginn meines Interesses für Space Art. Das, die Abbildung ist auch schon ein Werk von ihm, die Titelseite. Er hat sich als Atronaut bezeichnet und hat äh, den Anspruch gehabt, er ist der einzige echte Weltraumkünstler. Der hat das Privileg gehabt, auf mehreren ESA-Parabelflügen dabei zu sein und seine Werke waren auch auf diversen Weltraummissionen mit dabei. Er wollte eine Kunstakademie im All realisieren, aber das hat er nicht geschafft. Ich zitiere jetzt mal, die Schwerlosigkeit hat er als die Triebkraft der Kreativität und allen schöpferischen Schaffens angesehen. Und das sind ein paar Beispiele von Werken, die er gemacht hat. Ich habe das, das kann man alles auf seiner Website auch Anschauen, da ist noch viel mehr drauf. Ich wollte jetzt das nur, dass man mal sieht, wie das so aussieht, was er gemacht hat. Okay. Es gab auch, vielleicht kennt es jemand, die Skulptur Cosmic Dancer. Das ist das grüne Ding in dem Foto. Ah, okay. Das wusste ich nicht. Ja, also der Cosmic Dancer, das hat mich damals auch fasziniert, wo ich das gelesen habe, wurde extra für die Schwerelosigkeit geschaffen. Die Skulptur kann man nicht irgendwie hinstellen, weil es halt eigentlich kein, keine Richtung hat und dafür gedacht ist, dass es auf einer Raumstation einfach in der Gegend rumschwebt und man das dann anguckt. Und es soll als 3D-Druck was Neues auf die ISS, aber ich habe jetzt auch nicht mehr Informationen. Ich weiß nur, dass das auf der Webseite steht, da was drüber, dass, dass das neu aufgelegt werden soll. Und es ist aber eine der wenigen Skulpturen, die in Schwerlosigkeit waren. Was ist los? Just a moment, sorry. Uh, the screen sharing is a uh, we, 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 it's not uh, live. But my hands could ever know the screen no, sharing. No, sorry. Oh. Mm -hmm. They they listen to you, but they didn't see your, your ah, okay. so far. So I, I maybe you can go to the beginning maybe and then make we a, a summary, a, a quick uh, view. We we click through the slides yes, until yes. this point that the others Okay, let me say uh, something. We had a, a, a technical technical problem, so we didn't we didn't show online. Yeah. Yes, yes. I was just explaining to the people. Okay. Good. So we will repeat quickly the previous slides in order that everyone can see them. I'm sorry for that. Thank you. Okay. Is it online now? Yeah. So we go to the beginning. Okay, so now it's online. Ja. Yeah. Okay, also wir gehen jetzt noch mal kurz, einfach so vielleicht ein paar Sekunden stehen lassen, bis zu dem Punkt, wo ich war. Ihr habt es ja gehört, genau. aber das... Okay. Okay, 
Du weißt, was ich meine, oder? Ja, ja. Okay. Ja, hauptsächlich halt die mit den Bildern. We show now okay, uh, shortly das the slides and then we show shortly the slides for the people who have not seen it. And uh, then she goes on with her lecture. Okay, das war der Frank Pietro Gino mit seinem ja und Charles Wilp. Das war der Cosmic Dancer, den es eventuell als Neuauflage geben soll und ich glaube, da waren wir auch stehen geblieben. Genau. Und Next dann die nächste, da gab es nämlich noch mal was von Eduardo Katsch. Das ist dieses weiße Teil, das hat der ähm, Thomas Pesquet, wo er auf der ISS war, aus zwei Blättern Papier ausgeschnitten. Und ist das erste tatsächlich im Weltraum geschaffene Kunstprojekt. Und das war auf dem DLR Parabelflug. Da gab es auch mal was, wo sie Skulpturen gemacht haben, die so ein bisschen halbwissenschaftlich auch waren. Die Murmeln in der Box sollten den Parabelflug visualisieren und dieser Wolkenkernscanner sollte irgendwas machen, dass man sieht, wie sich Wolkenpartikel verhalten. Aber eigentlich ist es auch eher so ein Kunstprojekt, weil da waren irgendwie nicht nur kleine Partikel drin, da waren irgendwie auch noch andere Sachen drin. Aber so ganz verstanden hatte ich das nicht. Also das war bei der zehnten Parabelflugkampagne vom DLR. Das ist also auch schon eine Weile her. Okay. Charles Wilb sagte, Musik war schon immer die schwereloseste Kunst. Es ist bekannt, dass Astronauten in ihrer Freizeit im All gern Musik machen. Ein paar Beispiele habe ich jetzt hier. Und eben, es gab schon unzählige Instrumente, Flöten, Keyboard, Gitarre, Saxophon, Dudelsack, japanische Instrumente. Und wahrscheinlich ist ein Großteil davon immer noch auf der ISS. Und manche wurden sogar extra für die ISS gebaut, weil sie irgendwie kleiner sein mussten oder weil sie bestimmte Anforderungen erfüllen mussten. Und Luca Parmitano hat tatsächlich für Big City Beats World Club Dome als DJ von der ISS aus war der zugeschaltet zu dieser Techno-Party. Chris Hatfield hat ein bekanntes Musikvideo aufgenommen. Das kann man hier auf YouTube finden. Den Link habe ich eingebaut. Falls Sie später noch mal die Aufzeichnung anschauen, können Sie sich das gerne dann anschauen. Es wäre jetzt, glaube ich, zu aufwendig und zu lang dauern, das hier abzuspielen. Genauso gibt es ein super Musikvideo in der Schwerlosigkeit von der Band OK Go, allerdings auf einem Parabelflug in Russland gedreht. Und da hat die Band auf ihrer Website sogar ein Making-of und wie sie das Ganze zusammengeschnitten haben, damit es aussieht, als wäre das ein Stück, obwohl es immer 30 Sekunden ähm, Schnipsel von Schwerelosigkeitsmomenten auf dem Parabelflug waren. Und der Witz ist, dass, dass der Bandleader und seine Schwester 2012 auf einem Parabelflug in Florida waren, auf dem ich auch war, aber ich wusste es gar nicht, weil ich die Band dort noch nicht gekannt habe. Ich habe es erst Jahre später erfahren, weil er das irgendwo erwähnt hat und dann dachte ich, das war doch mein Flug. <lacht> okay. Ja, Tanz ist eins von den Sachen, die ich gerne in Schwerlosigkeit machen würde. Dazu komme ich aber noch. Hitsu Dubois ist eine französische Tänzerin, die hat eigentlich in Europa damit angefangen, dass sie quasi die Wissenschaft und die Kunst da zusammengebracht hat und hat mit der ESA und den französischen Weltraumbehörde zusammengearbeitet, um Bewegung in Schwerelosigkeit zu erforschen. Die ist in dieser Caravelle und im A300 geflogen und hat auch mit der russischen Ilyushin mit der Künstlervereinigung Arztkatalyst Parabelflüge durchgeführt. Und ich habe jetzt ein kleines Video von einer dieser. Einfach mitten reinklicken, dann müsste es starten. Ich 
Das hat auch einen Ton, das setzt aber später ein. Also das würde ich jetzt einfach mal durchlaufen lassen. Das ist eins von den ESA-Parabelflügen, wo sie da was gemacht hat, zusammen mit anderen Tänzern und Tänzerinnen. Und es wurde dann auch auf irgendwie verschiedenen Kunstfestivals, geht noch weiter, aufgest aufgestellt und gezeigt. Weiter. Es gab auch noch weitere Tänzerinnen, die da was gemacht haben. Die Jeanne Robinson habe ich schon erwähnt mit Star Dance Trilogie und sie hätte ja auch sollen in den Weltraum fliegen. 2007 hat sie bei der Zero G Corporation einen Parabelflug gesponsert bekommen und das hätte eine Vorarbeit, war das eigentlich für den, eine Verfilmung der Star Dance Trilogie. Aber 2010 ist sie gestorben und das war dann leider das Ende. Und da habe ich jetzt auch einen kleinen Videoclip. Es gab dann auch noch Morag Whiteman und Jeanne Morel, die ist die neueste. Die arbeitet auch mit der französischen Raumfahrtbehörde zusammen. Ich habe hier einen Link zu einem Beispiel ihrer Arbeit, aber es hat auch im Internet. Ich weiß nicht, ob man das zeigen können. Eigentlich müssen wir draufklicken, funktionieren, dass dann das aufgeht. Das ist auch nur so ein kurzer Clip. Ich hoffe, es funktioniert. Ah. ah, doch, es ist da unten. Nee. Hä? Wieso geht das jetzt nicht? Ah, schade. Das funktioniert anscheinend nicht. Okay, Ja. Ja, sorry, aber da habe ich halt nichts, was ich jetzt irgendwie tatsächlich runterladen konnte. Es gab auch schon 99 von Dragan Sivadinov. Sein kosmokinetisches Kabinett Nordung ist ein abstraktes Theater. Da hat er quasi die Schwerelosigkeit zur Bühne gemacht. Und er wollte, dass dadurch die Grenze zum Publikum verschwimmt und irgendwann die, das Ganze quasi auf Lebenszeit weitergeführt wird und darüber hinaus, dass die Künstler dann, wenn sie sterben, durch irgendeinen Avatar oder so irgendwie virtuell ersetzt werden oder so ähnlich. Ich weiß aber nicht, ob das weiterlief. Die meisten werden halt von der Bühne äh, das nur als Zaubertrick kennen. Aber er hat halt dann quasi selber alles in die Schwerlosigkeit geführt. Und diese Performance, Zero Genie, das 
war auch was, was mal auf dem russischen Flieger gelaufen, ge, gemacht worden ist. Er hat quasi den fliegenden Teppich Realität werden lassen. Man kann, äh, noch mal zurück, bitte. Man kann natürlich quasi, also man, wenn man sich das Video anguckt, das Ganze läuft dann ein bisschen aus dem Ruder, weil er irgendwie dann die Kontrolle über das Ganze nicht mehr so hat. Und ich habe jetzt auch vor einiger Zeit einen Künstler, den Adam Deipert, kennengelernt. Der möchte in Schwerelosigkeit jonglieren, hat aber momentan das noch nicht in echter Schwerelosigkeit geschafft, sondern quasi so ein, ähm, eine Simulation, wo er dann irgendwelche Bälle auf einer Oberfläche und er hängt oben drüber in einem Geschirr und jongliert dadurch, dass er die Bälle auf der Oberfläche dann... Ähm, in, da ähm, rumschubst und quasi so, wie es sieht schon aus wie jonglieren, aber ob es so in Schwerelosigkeit geht, wenn die Bälle dann wild durcheinander fliegen, weiß ich auch nicht. Das können Sie sich gern mal auf YouTube anschauen. Das, ja, da das leider nicht funktioniert, lass man das jetzt. Okay. Filme gab es einige, die Schwerelosigkeit entweder tatsächlich drin haben als, als Effekt oder tatsächlich sogar in Schwerlosigkeit gedreht sind. Apollo 13 kennen Sie vielleicht. Ähm, ich glaube, bei den Filmen Salyut 7 und Gravity hat man es simuliert, aber bei dem Stand für die Mumie mit Tom Cruise, da sind sie in Frankreich in einen Parabelflieger gegangen. Könnte man vielleicht probieren, ob der YouTube ja, links. Ah, okay. Ja, und das sind jetzt eigentlich meine eigenen Ambitionen. Ich bin selber schon auf Parabelflügen gewesen und ich würde eigentlich gern mal eine Performance machen, ähm, wo ich selber einen Tanz mache in Schwerelosigkeit. Allerdings nicht, wie vorher gesehen, mit so einem engen Anzug, sondern mit einem Kostüm, das tatsächlich für die Schwerelosigkeit gemacht ist, damit man das auch sieht und damit man sieht, dass es nicht irgendwo irgendein Trick ist. Und das war es auch schon. Ähm, vielen, vielen, vielen lieben Dank. Natürlich bekommst du auch als Sprecherin eine ja, Broschüre über die Archenholz-Stahlmarke, Blick in das Weltall. Und da möchtest du ja auch irgendwann mal hin. Ja, gerne. Genau. Äh, vielen Dank. Äh, ich freue mich auch, dass du nicht nur bildende Kunst, sondern eben, dass eben mal auch Tanz und äh, Musik äh, mit erwähnt worden ist, was ich ja auch in meinem Aufruf äh, Artbus to Mars äh, gesagt habe. Weil Kunst ist eben nicht nur Bilder, es ist mehr. Aber dazu komme ich dann in meinem Vortrag. Mhm. Vielen herzlichen ja. Dank. Ja. Vielleicht schicke ich ja auch was ein. Ja, sehr schön. Das wäre <lacht> super. Äh, unsere nächste Gästin, äh, our next guest, also thank you, thank you, thank you to Tanja Lehmann. Uh, our next guest uh, is Priscilla Thomas and uh, the participants which are here in our Space Renaissance Art and Science Festival had the, um, the pleasure to see her artwork and um, Yeah, we talked about this and um, you have seen it. Uh, I wanted to send you photos, uh, but I forgot my smartphone today. Um, Priscilla, welcome. Are you there? Hi. We will share our video. Ah, yeah, we will share. I am going to the main show. I think it's very important to the world and, and civilization's future. Um, Priscilla, I'm back. Yeah, she will square the screen. Okay, great. All right. The reason it's important is because I think that we are catching some of the contributions that we can make to Can you make the audio better? But not, not really as much as we could. And I think part of the reason I'm not capturing is the main thing that contributions can inspire, not speaking the language, uh, not letting the deficit off the way. 
Is it better now? Yeah. Okay, it's better. Uh, Priscilla, Priscilla, can you hear me? Ah, this is recorded. Okay. Ah, she's recorded, yeah. Then that could go. Preparation, preparation, 
this opportunity, we're preparing that path to population to the theater. So the space park takes us back to figure the heart, kind of metal chunky rocket stuff. And all the space art that I've seen, and what I've tried to design, is turn all that hard set, you know, set and stuff, and turn it into something really inspiring, uh, something that touches the soul. Uh, not the fact that we can take you back, but for most of us, they don't. So I'm, I'm going to share with you the beginnings of a series uh, that I'm working on that will make more of a chance to start our whole series on the scriptures. And uh, I'm going to share with you uh, some of those pieces and like to see where I'm going with this. And I think the world is going really well. To reach these people, you need to understand that it's not what you see or not what you look at that matters, it's what you see. So we need to make sure we're working on stuff. The heart of mind. Uh, women from all over life are fantastic. So part of this is that we are going to gather contributions from all kinds of people, all kinds of women. This piece of violence and more is inspired by the tremendous variety of ways women contribute to our pushing out for the space. Um, Culture and society is more than uh, driven and a woman achieving. All kinds of people making contributions, all kinds of people being part of that uh, piece of civilization that we're sending out. So here's the assembly line workers, the admin specialists to keep things moving, to the advocates lobbying for us in Congress. With the new women and years bring fresh ideas and energy and the women of all stripes who fly under the public radar but make it all happen. It's one of my most uh, it's one of my favorite pieces. This one is new, it's not quite complete yet. It's, it's still kind of a further phase of it, but this one was inspired by, by Wally Funk. Um, I was only vaguely aware of Wally Funk. Before she uh, took that flight in 2021, I feel well, at the time, I feel the only person is going to space. But when I find out more about her, I saw that she began the beginning of her career in all the way back. She showed the past like that long game with pride and class. Uh, this piece is inspired by all the ones in 1939. And during high school, she couldn't take shots or Woodworking or anything, none of that. She, she was told, you know, to your female, you can take home that. And she said, well, I'm having none of that. She took my job. She found a college that had a flying program, a flight uh, program. She said, she's got two of them. She went one by us, the other goes to the industry. And she got all oh, tons of offline uh, certification. Uh, she got with the community to become a commercial pilot, but she did the job. Every time she tries to talk to them. <laughs> Women don't do that. Um, she went on to say a lot of uh, really glass blowing stuff to the FAA and, and the Women's Space Program, or we call the 13, uh, was opened up. She was, she was on, even though she did not say accepted her. And uh, she went through, and never really got quite the end of the program, but for all of she was just excelling at this. I forget one of them, she did that to John, but she did that to John. Finally, July 2021, she sold this one from Bristol Tecton. We go into this, and she still involved in education and knowledge of her kids. We love her story. This is a piece, uh, this is about the people behind the scenes. Uh, those with strong souls aren't the only stars. This piece is inspired when I went to see the set. And behind the scenes, you look at hands of light and say, when John always said, I was rough. One time, story for another time. Uh, but it really touched me at that point with all the people behind the scenes who don't get these glamorous title jobs, but they make it happen. The workers, uh, the people. Maintenance on the uh, wind tunnel turbine 
find myself like in awesome heart and exploding out from the universe. So I felt the universe had a question to contact me. I don't know. 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 I her artwork, this all are originals, and she uh, wrote me that she is donating the half of uh, what she thought to the SRI. She also is Business Science member. Uh, so thank you, Priscilla, for this great donation. Thank you for trusting me and sending me the, the pictures. And they are really, really great. And I am sure, or I hope we will find um, or we will sell some pictures. Uh, uh, yes, uh, also what to say while we are talking about things that are in the book sale here outside, that we have a few copies of uh, some books. Uh, one is the complete acta of the papers presented at the 2021 SRI Congress. And the other one is the Space Resident Manifesto is a collection of 10 founding papers uh, including the manifesto and other nine papers uh, of uh, special SS founders. Uh, so here outside on the table. Okay. Please, please submit. Yeah. Um, our next um, guest, um, she's also online or not present. She sent us a movie um, and we had. Um, Tanya already with uh, zero gravity and Sarah Trat uh, sent us a movie, Leaving the Loops, as an experimental movie about space dogs. And um, I guess we will not be able to show the movie in full length, um, but later, yeah, we cannot show it in full length because uh, I think it is one hour or and we have 20 minutes, so we will stop it after 20 minutes, and I think we will get an impression. Uh, what is it about? Um, not sure to have this. Sarah Draht. Is it with Tanya No, no, Sarah Draht. Uh, Jürgen Rosa has sent it. Look at her. Okay, so we, we, we have to, <coughs> to look for that movie. Sorry for that. Okay. So I would suggest uh, the following. Um, uh, is Anna Larsen already here? Um, and he didn't show up so far, but he has to show up in 10 minutes. Um, then uh, are there any questions uh, to the speakers before or not? Um, 
because then I would say, um, then I can give my lecture, uh, Why Art in Space? Share the screen and put my lecture simply. And uh, then we will have lunch simply. Uh, the English version, yeah, then, so then I. But you can see it also on the small screen there. Yeah, but I need uh, the text. Yeah, okay. No, make full screen. Is it there? Yeah. So can go. why art in space? Uh, because I have very often people ask me why art in space? Uh, what is this so special and space art? And why now artists uh, yeah, are so keen on space art or on art in space? And um, yeah, I thought, um, also I'm really happy that art has found its way into this society, into other societies, uh, and there do exist space art societies. Next slide, please. This is a German version, but uh, okay, egal, take it. Yeah, 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 go on. Next one. Uh, if you think uh, artists are useless, try to spend your quarantine uh, without music, books, poems, movies, literature, and games. Next slide. Art is, art is very diverse, and uh, we encounter it in the most varied uh, levels of everyday life just like science and politics. And even people are not interested in it, um, they are nonetheless constantly subject of its influence. And um, <clears throat> in the artistic level, it's mainly design, music, movie, games, as you can see here, dance, theater, and literature. And in the field of science, it's many things that we use today as a matter of course, such as the internet or smartphone, to name just two examples. Um, but not only the media as such, um, can you make the next slide? But on, not only the, the next slide, please. Uh, yeah, uh, next slide. But not only the media such as radio and television, also many other uh, everyday products, um, you can use this, yeah, um, that we use uh, every day are the result of decades of research and uh, the technical implementation. And we think, take things for granted what our grandparents didn't even thing could ever exist. The next slide. I thought it was, yeah, you know. Yeah, the coronavirus has changed our organization and structures worldwide, also like before, but anyhow. That also has positive aspects. Uh, new technologies have uh, received their votes, boost gets, gets now the next slide. Yeah, uh, out of the need to maintain uh, communication structures. This can also be an opportunity. Digitization has entered the world in a new dimension. Elements will find their way into art, be it as artificial intelligence, uh, which is already taking place, or in 3D printing, video technology, or other electronic forms and entirely new art formats will emerge. Um, the next slide. Uh, I need to know much about, you know, no, 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 no,
I give you the, the, yeah, 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 the mouse. Yeah, give me the mouse and then for that. Um, the new technical possibilities that arise now also influence uh, content and that could become the art of mentoring, uh, men mentoring into space. What can art do that science cannot? And um, now I will have a short look into the history. Um, the task of art has constantly changed and uh, is constantly changing. And uh, even the people of the Stone Age began to depict uh, the environment in a visual form. Here is a caving drawing, a cave drawing with an image of the sun, but moon phase uh, drawings were also found. And these are the first evidence of scientific observation. Um, the observation of the stars uh, already uh, played a major role um, among the indigenous peoples, partly for religious reasons, but above all, uh, because they are much more connected to nature than we are today. And for example, when the seasons changed or the harvest has, um, <clears throat> and as an orientation, of course. The church later used paintings to tell the story of survival um, to people who could largely uh, not read or write. And the rulers used art uh, to have themselves represented or to decorate their house uh, with art and to display their wheels. Uh -huh. Uh, an art one is free and not bound to the exactness of science, but the artist can use imagination and emotion means uh, to express scientific ideas, hypothesis and content without having to follow the strict rules of scientific uh, probability or proof. And um, that makes them understandable in different ways. Uh, but not only that, it can be way ahead of its time. Leonardo da Vinci, for example, with his flying machines, Chesley Bonster with his visionary drawings, and not to forget science fiction literature. This painting is not from Chesley Bonster, it's from David Hardy. Uh, I really like his artwork, and um, I hope uh, he forgives me that uh, I took a, a painting from his early uh, time when he. Uh, started all this, young men, um, and uh, he posted it on, on Facebook uh, once. And uh, I think it, it's very modern. If you um, look at the latest um, yeah, the signs of Luna or Mars uh, bases, they are not so far away from this drawing. And, uh, and he made this drawing uh, about 70 years ago, as I imagine this. And uh, I also would like to show um, or draw, uh, point out that in former times uh, they have painted uh, the, the surface of uh, so not only David Hardy, mostly all painters, uh, sharp rockets. And uh, then when they landed on the moon, they found they are not sharp rockets. It's more soft. Um, yeah. Uh, Jack Williamson published the novel Collision Orbit in 1942 under the pseudonym uh, Will Stewart. And in it, he formulated the idea of a global remodeling of planets by humans and used the term, term terraforming uh, the first, for the first time. Today, this term is technical is in general use and by no means only for the reshaping of Venus and Mars. Um, Stanislav Lem, uh, I would like to mention him uh, because he is considered a brilliant visionary and utopian who devised numerous complex technologies decades before they were actually developed. Uh, as early as the 1960s and 1970s, he wrote on topics such as nanotechnology, neural, uh, yeah, neural networks and virtual reality. 
and um, recurring topics uh, are philosophical and ethical aspects and problems of technical development, such as artificial, artificial intelligence, human-like robots, or genetic engineering. In many of his works, he used satire and humorous means, often clandestinely exposing human superiority based on belief in technology and science as hybrid. Here you can see some of his books. Um, someone is entering, I think. Another example for the visionary power of artistic vision is given to us by Galileo Galilei. And uh, this is drawings uh, of the moon and the Sidereus Nuncius. Since he had an artistic training, he was able to recognize that the shadings of the surface of the moon were mountains and valleys. He perceived uh, the contrast between light and dark as it were three dimensional. Uh, here it was a fortunate uh, coincidence uh, that the scientific genius was joined by artistic uh, education and talent. Uh, that might be interesting for you, Michael. <laughs> And um, this contrasts with the drawings by Schiaparelli, who saw canals and the surface of, um, uh, of, um, of the structures. And uh, this uh, has long been considered the official theory and viewed the idea of life on Mars. And um, Flammarion also shows an illustration with the canals in his book Himmelsbunde für das Volk, while his own observations do not show any canals, as shown here in these pictures. And not to forget uh, Johannes Kepler. He is a key figure in the nine, uh, 17th uh, century's um, scientific revolution, best known for his laws of planetary motion. And he was probably the first science fiction author with his somnium and his description from a trip to the moon. I know nothing with any certainty, but the sight of the stars makes me dream, Leonardo da Vinci. In the Renaissance, many scientists were also artists. They were polymers. Nowadays, the branch of science are so specialized that uh, there are hardly any polymats left. We want to think uh, outside the box again and draw the link between art and science. It's a dream of mankind to fly, to go to the universe and settlement and space. There are models and studies, but apart from the ISS and its predecessors, living in space has so far remained wishful thinking. Recently, however, attempts to do so have become more and more concrete, not least uh, thanks to advances in space technology. Living in space, as on the environment is metallic, dark, oil trips uh, through the picture, and somewhere, hands of geigers in squares through the corridors. An astronaut sitting comfortably on a sofa is almost nowhere to be found. And yet space pioneers uh, were already thinking about how to make themselves as comfortable as possible, at least with the Soviets. The state space company RKK as um, Energia employed Agalina Balashava, uh, an architect who was exclusively responsible for the interior design of the space shuttles and quickly realized that she had to start from scratch. New questions had to be answered. How do you orient yourself in zero gravity? Balashava developed a color concept that made uh, it easier to distinguish between uh, floors and ceilings. Yellow for walls and ceilings and turquoise blue for the fronts of the furniture and green for the floor. For the mobile home uh, so used, she designed a sofa a built-in wardrobe and a toilet. For the Mir space station, she designed 
uh, benches, sleeping accommodations and cabinets, and for the sake of better mobility, combined the living and the technical areas as a unit for, uh, for the first time. The con concept is still in use uh, today for the basis of ISS. And when the two models of Soyuz and Apollo were coupled together, the Americans were somewhat ambitious by La um, because their space probe was not all orientated towards quality of life, but only towards technical possibilities. Um, when we think about settlement in space, it will be the case that people will one day leave the Earth behind forever. But they will take with them, in addition to the technical equipment, uh, their experiences, their culture, um, their language, religion, and education. And every astronaut, cosmonaut, taikonaut, or whatever their name is, has taken a mascot with them into space. Something that reminds them of their home in space, on Earth. And so it will be with the people who leave the Earth to live, for example, on the Moon, Mars, or an artificial habitat, or elsewhere. It will take their memories, their images of Earth, photographs, and other things with them and build on them in their new living space. A new kind of art culture you have, I think you have to start here now. I have to start it. The video on my way. Yeah, the video is yes, this one. Yeah, yeah, it's okay. It's running down by, by its own. Uh, a new kind of uh, art and culture will emerge. The next picture then. The next picture. Yeah. And um, this is, for example, an, an, um, an example how it could be when the Milky Way is settled. Uh, the next picture. And new kind of art and culture will emerge and perhaps a new form of government, a new legal system and possibly even new religions. Um, what is space art? Next slide. Um, space art or astronomical art is a genre of modern artistic uh, expressions emerging from knowledge and ideas associated with outer space. This is uh, the official version from the um, uh, International Association of Astronomical Artists. And uh, further, they say um, both as a source of inspiration and as a means for visualizing and promoting space travel. Like other genres of artistic creation, space art has many facets and encompasses um, realism, impressionism, hardware, sculpture, abstract imaginary, and even zoological art. Though artists have been making art with astronomical elements for a long time, the genre of space art itself is still in its infancy. And having begun only when humanity, humanity gained the ability to look off uh, of our world and artistically depict what we see out there. Uh, as the time is becoming short, I will not describe uh, further. Yeah, next slide. Um, here you can see an example um, of visualizing uh, things. Uh, you have an art with the uh, picture uh, with the surface of the moon and the moon hot, and the next picture. But if you look at this picture with the real light, uh, then you see the tardigrades on the moon. This picture uh, is made with um, fluorescent painting or phosphorescent painting and the glow in the dark, if you hit them with the real light. Uh, in 19, uh, next picture. Uh, the 19, I don't know when it was exactly. Yeah, uh, moment. Um, okay, the Israeli space probe, um, Bereshit crashed on the surface of the moon. I have not the date on my mind exactly. 
and uh, this um, in uh, April 2019, and it had uh, thousands of Charlie grades uh, on board, uh, each less than one millimeter in size. And uh, Charlie grades belongs to the extreme of fights, and they can survive in extremely harsh environments. And um, yeah, I want to make visible uh, the study grades. And the funny thing is, when I had finished this picture and half a year later in uh, India, uh, some scientists um, found, I can go here, yeah, uh, found um, brown study grades and they hit them with high doses of UV light and they turned blue. So like I have foreseen this. And thank you, slide please. Uh, this is a uh, cosmonaut in space. Uh, next slide. And if I hit this with UV light, you can see the light pollution on Earth. It's also a topic what's better as me uh, because um, light, and uh, it's the first time uh, as it has changed our lives completely. And it was night, nice that we could uh, see something in the dark. Uh, but now it has uh, changed the bio rhythm, rhythm not only of humans only of uh, certain animals uh, or because um, we sleep less. Um, um, yeah, and uh, not to forget uh, the astronomical aspect, the light pollution on Earth. Next slide, please. Yeah, you, you, you see, the, uh, so uh, this I wanted to mention too, that the uh, fluorescent and phosphorescent painting it allows me to hide two pictures in one, so to say. Next slide, please. And uh, now we have to run the, the movie. It is, uh, make in fact in the next slide. I must short run on this. Uh, is um, uh, space debris at uh, the court space debris. This uh, debris. Uh, you see uh, the hands holding um, tenderly the earth, but. Um, yeah, we have uh, the space debris uh, surrounding or orbiting our planet. And um, yeah, if we want to go to space, uh, we have to find a solution for this, uh, because not only for this, uh, although the radio or optical astronomy is disturbed by, by the space debris. Next slide, please. Next slide. These are uh, two examples uh, for um, how it may look like uh, underneath a yeah, icy skin of a, like an Enceladus of an icy moon, like Enceladus. Next slide, please. Um, this is an other example uh, for a combination from two kinds of art artworks. Um, this is um, Rick Wakeman, and he's a composer and composed a lot of music for um, for Mars. And um, the title uh, picture is from me. Uh, and he gave uh, a large interview about Mars. Uh, so he's also a, an artist interested in science. Next slide. And uh, at our SRI, we have a, a group, uh, an art group on Facebook. Um, next slide. And we also have um, installed a webinar series and um, where we get talks and can, can, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, a webinar series where we um, invite um, scientists uh, to to build a bridge between art and science. Uh, here we had uh, Robert Subrin, next slide. And uh, Dr. Chosek is also uh, very famous and well known. Uh, and he very often was also our guest. And today he is here. I'm so happy about this. And uh, he also uh, built a bridge, next slide, uh, about art and science. Uh, he's talking about. Uh, will the aliens have music and this lecture we will hear today uh, or listen and uh, next slide please. Uh, this was also an, a webinar we gave about women and astronomy. Next slide. 
And um, on our web con work contrast last year, we had uh, also uh, for the first time uh, an art chapter where we presented different kind of arts uh, like uh, digital art, uh, music composition, performance, dancing, painting, and uh, literature. Next slide. And today in the morning, we had our great art project, Art Goes to Mars. And this is in collaboration with the Mars Society and uh, the Planetarium Berlin Foundation. Um, next slide, please. And we launched this year in our Space Room of Science, uh, Art and Science Festival, in case that you join us now. Next slide, please. And um, this festival, I wanted to thank uh, again our sponsors. Next time. And uh, I hope we, with our artwork and our Art Goes to Mars project, we can lay the first cornerstone uh, for a library on Mars because we want to bring this artwork on a USB stick. And if we can uh, find uh, raise enough money um uh, to put this, uh, this artwork in, in a book and uh, bring this book on my next slide and i think we have to do this together all together not only alone that uh, will not end and if we go to space like it is on the left hand side in a disaster i hope we will uh, go to mars all together we work together and we bring art together on mars and uh, art, if you take music, music is a language that everyone understands. And in this sentence, I would close my lecture. Art uh, brings us together and we want to bring art to us. Thank you. So I guess... Uh, Yes, Thank you, Sabine. Thank you yes. very much for your lecture. Yeah. And I want also uh, thank you very much for organizing this festival in Berlin. I know it was a hard work for all of us, but most of all for you. But you had to think about everything here to, to make it a, a, a great festival, really, a success. So thank you very much, Sabine. Thank you. Applause. Thank you. Um, is um, that uh, Ina Larsen showed up? Uh, so Ina Can Larsen you? did I show up? So, I, I, um, I, I, so uh, our next guest didn't show up, so I would suggest that we have lunch and we meet again at two o'clock. Yeah, okay. So we have one and a half hour lunch, a nice lunch break. And um, yesterday I have learned that on the Island Berlin, if you go over the bridge, there's also a small restaurant. So maybe we should try this today. I'm you happy to see you, you. yeah. <laughs> In person next time would be better, but uh, congratulations for the wonderful festival. Yes. Have you followed our, our session or our program today? Did you follow? Uh, most of the program I've been following. Yes, oh, I yeah. that I missed, but um, for most of them, yes, yes. How is it going, Kush? It's a uh, oh, moment. Audience is good. Oh, yeah. One yes. minute to start. One minute to start. So we can teach chat. We can share some gossips. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh and yeah. we have a hum. <laughs> uh, you can play it. You can no, play no, it. No, no, no. It's not the right, the right one. No, no. Yeah, she was the giver. It's the only one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, in the meantime.